Good morning, church. Good morning. Ah, it's good to see you today. Would you stand with us, please? What a great day it is to come into the presence of God and the greatness of God, knowing that God is always here. He's always with us no matter where we are. It doesn't matter if we're here or at home or whatever. God is always with us. Just yes. thankful for his great grace and goodness. We do give him praise and thanks today. Give him glory. Father, we just praise you right now. We thank you, Lord. We worship you. We worship you. We thank the Lord. Thank the Lord God today. Praise the name of the Lord God. Thank the Lord Jesus. Bless the name of the Lord. Jesus gave us these words. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. And he says, you are my friends if you do what I command. Yes. He said, I no longer call you servants. He's talking to his disciples. Because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. For everything that I've learned from my father, I have made known to you. We are friends of God today. And I'm glad that he has provided us that relationship today. We are thankful today that we are a friend of God today. We give him praise.
this morning. My God, we thank you and praise the holy name of Jesus. Thanks to the name of the Lord God. Praise the name. We've come to give him praise today to magnify the name of Jesus. of the Lord. How many of you keep track of what's going on in the news? Three of us. Oh, come on, the rest of you. How many wish they didn't? Yeah, how many wish you didn't keep up with the news? <laughs> no matter what is going on in the news today, no matter what you see, no matter what you witness with your own eyes, our God is great. Yes. Splendor of King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice. To get away, to get, to watch the news get you distracted, whatever you tune in on the internet, get you distracted. But what you have to keep focused on, refocus, this is what this is all about today, refocusing what you see. God is still in control. Amen. That's right. God is still in control. Play it now, would you? Splendor of 
my daily devotion today. One of the readings in the devotion part said that we must pre-surrender to God. And I read it out and I thought, that's the lamest thing I've, I've, I've read lately. I must pre-surrender to God. But as I read further into it, too many times we want to say, okay, God, I will do this, but let me know what it is you're asking me to do. And we have to come to the place of saying, God, I will do whatever you ask me to do. Yes. I will do that. Then we allow God to fill in the blank. That's right. This is my desire to honor you. Lord, with all my heart, I worship you. All I have within me, I give you praise. All that I adore is in you. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I live for you. We never know what God is going to ask us to do, but we've got to set it up beforehand. Before he asks, we've got to be willing to say, God, I'll do whatever it is right. you have asked me yes. to do. Amen. And I, I 
I stand, I stand in awe of you. I stand, I stand in awe of you. Holy God, to whom all praise is due, I stand. Now, um, we're going to be talking today about the perfect bridge, um, but we're going to be dealing with bridges. By the way, that was that's uh, San Francisco Bridge. I, um, we had the opportunity to go there about that same spot several years ago. Um, but bridges, we're talking about the perfect bridge in John chapter 1. Now, we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll let you turn there. We're, we're going to be dealing with several other bridges, and I'm still kind of managing through what we're going to be talking about, but, but likely we're going to be bridging the idea, uh, talking about bridging culture, bridging division, bridging the world, maybe bridging shame, but there are several things we'll be talking about here for the next few weeks. But we'll start today with a perfect bridge in John chapter 1. And it reads, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The light came that gives light to every man as was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born, uh, born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, nor a husband's will, but born of God. For the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from God, from Father, full of grace and truth. There's a story of two brothers had adjoining farms, and they fell into conflict with each other. 
after working together for 40 years, huge divide. It was something small, but, but, but one thing led to another that led to something else that led to something else. And finally, it, it exploded in this huge exchange of bitter words and angry insults, followed by weeks of silence. One morning, there was a knock on the older son's brother, the older brother's door. And he stood, opened the door there, stood there with a, with a carpenter's, a, a carpenter with a big toolbox. And the guy says, I'm looking for a few days hard work. Perhaps you have some small jobs around here that I could, I could help you with. He says, well, you know what, come to think about it, yes, I do. He said, look across this creek here. See that farm over there? That's my brother. And last week, my brother got out there with a, with a, with a, a, a backhoe and dug this trench, this ditch between us. So I'm thinking, all right, there's a whole pile of wood over there. Build me a wall so I don't have to look at his, at his place over there. Guy says, show me the pile. Got the nails, I got them. Guy starts to work, he tells the guy, the owner says, to the worker says, I'll be gone until later on in the day. Guy says, it'll be taken care of. Guy goes to work, carpenter goes to work. At the end of the day, this guy comes home and there's no wall, there's no fence there. Instead, this guy built a bridge from this guy's property to his brother's property. Well, the owner just threw a fit. How many of you know what a hissy fit is? Yeah, he, he threw one of those. You did not do what I told you to do. And as he looked up, he sees his brother coming toward him. And his brother gets on the middle of the bridge and just stands there. And finally, the guy goes, meets his brother. The younger brother stretches out his hand and says, you're quite the guy. After all I've said and done, they shook hands, separated their, or got their, the separation back together again. When they saw the carpenter leaving, the older brother says, wait a minute, wait a minute. I've got some of the projects for you to do. And the guy says, you know, I'd love to, but I have a lot more bridges to build. Dictionaries define bridges as a structure over a river or chasm to provide a way of cross. Greg, you're in one area and I'm in another area, but, but I can't get to you. I need something to bridge that gap. There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a divide, a chasm between us. Now, a bridge can be something very simple. It can be just a, a plank across the, the, the creek or, or a log that has fallen across the way. Or it can be the Golden Gate Bridge. Let me show you some other bridges. This is the world's longest walking bridge found in Switzerland. Now, I don't mind bridges. I don't know if I could get across this one. There's just something about that that I look at that and think, no, nah, I'll stay here. Let me show you another bridge. This is the Tower Bridge in London. I've been to London and I've been near that. It's a massive, incredible structure. Beautiful bridge. That's a serious bridge. But, and then there's this one. This is the Harbour Bridge in Sydney, Australia. Usually on New Year's Eve, you'll see this one lit up for, with fireworks celebrating the new year. We get to see that several hours before it finally gets to us. But this is a Harbor Bridge, beautiful bridge. Bridges can be magnificent structures like this, or it can just be a plank laying out there. Whatever the bridge, they all do the same thing. They provide access across the divide that would normally not be able to cross. This morning I want to talk is about bridges, but we begin with a perfect bridge. The perfect bridge that came into this world. Now a chasm or a divide can look like something like the Grand Canyon. Anybody been to the Grand Canyon? That is imposing. 
And, and, and the times I've been out there, I've, of course, I've always had a camera, and I think, oh, this is fantastic. And you shoot a picture, and you get it back, and you think, oh, well, that's junk. I mean, that's, that's not even close to what it looked like. Th there is just no way to capture when you see the magnificent of the Grand Canyon. There's no way to put that on a print, on a digital print, and say, yep, yeah, that's what it was like. No, it's phenomenal. And sometimes the chasms, the bridges, the, 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 the gaps in our lives may seem like that. And a chasm may be something that looks like it's impossible to bridge. You can't get from here to there because it is too big. It is too deep. Today we're going to be talking about a chasm. But the chasm I'm speaking about is the chasm or the divide that lies between a holy God and a sinful people here on earth. And the bridge between those two is nothing more than the name of Jesus. The bridge is the cross of Jesus Christ in which he died upon to give us life eternal. That bridge is Jesus. That's why he is the perfect bridge to bridge the gap, the chasm between all of humanity and a holy God. Now the story starts in the beginning of the Bible when we read of God the Creator making planet Earth, placing on the Earth all of the plants, all of the animals. He placed humanity there. It was a perfect situation. Adam and Eve are brought into this world, the first humans, and they were the first people to walk upon this Earth. God created them. They lived in this garden of incredible beauty, unparalleled beauty. This is where they lived. It was a place of perfection. Oh, to be there. The environment that they lived was one of perfection. Plenty of food, plenty of water, nothing to fear, that a relationship with God and all of His creation, it was in perfect harmony. Now remember, if, if you read through the story of, of the book of, of Genesis and the story of creation, one of, the, one of the jobs that Adam had to do was to name all the animals. Now, you know the ones he started with. Rhinoceros, hippopotamus. As he gets deep into it, it's dog, cat. He was done. A place of perfection. It is hard for us to comprehend a place of perfection these days because we are born in to civility, to, to evil. We are born into a place where there is no peace. But the environment that they were born into, given into, was perfection. There was love, there was trust, there was peace, there was intimacy. But as you read through the Bible, we learn that this beautiful relationship between God and His people was eventually ruined. Ruined by Adam and Eve's disobedience, by their pride by what we would call sin. You don't have to turn there, but in Genesis chapter 3 is this story. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animals the Lord had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. Satan says you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. And she gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. In that moment of time, Adam and Eve had disobeyed God, and in doing so, caused separation between them and a holy God. Their disobedience caused every single human born into this world to be born with the same separation problem. We are separated from God. Sin is the problem. 
We are all born as sinful creatures, and sin is like a terminal disease that isolates us from God and causes us to die eventually. Death on this earth came as a result of sin. Paul, hundreds of years after, uh, centuries after, uh, we read in, in Genesis chapter 3, Paul wrote these words, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. God's Word says that the wages, the penalty of sin is death. Physical death, spiritual death is what he's talking about. And spiritual death means separation from God and all that is good in this life. The Bible says this results in judgment and it eventually results in hell if we don't turn things around and come back into a right relationship with God. You see, there cannot be any sin in heaven. And there is no sin in heaven. And if it would be, then it wouldn't be heaven any longer, dear friends. Therefore, God chose to bridge the gap. Many people today try and bridge the gap by themselves. They realize that there's something going on in their life, there's something lost in their life, there's something missing. And so people try and bridge the gap these days on their own. They want a relationship with God, they want to get to heaven, and they will try all sorts of things to get that way. Now, one of the ways in which people try and get to God is through religion. I've heard people say that there are almost as many religions in the world as there are countries. Now that may be an exaggeration, but many people in the world are very religious and they'll do all sorts of things to try and use religion to get them into a relationship with God. They try to please God. Well, if I do this, if I recite these prayers, if I fast and do without food, maybe that'll get me to God. If I light candles, maybe that will get me to God. They have special religious ceremonies. But the problem is that the Bible tells us that God isn't interested in religious activities. He doesn't care two hoots about religion, but He is concerned about a relationship with you. He wants that relationship. He's interested in our hearts. Religious activities of themselves do nothing to bridge the gap between us and God because we are still sinners. John tells us here in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. John begins the Gospel by calling Jesus the Word. Notice the Word is capitalized. And using this term for Jesus, John presents Him as the, the personal Word of God and indicates that in these last days God has spoken to us in and through His Son, Jesus. The Bible clearly uh, de declares that Jesus is the manifold wisdom of God, the perfect revelation of the nature and the person of God. Now, if you turn to John chapter 14, Jesus is meeting with His disciples at the Passover meal, hours before He would go to the cross for the sins of the world. And He tells His men, He had already told them, listen, I'm going to be going away. And in chapter 14 of John, he says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. And if it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that where I am, there you may be with me. You know the way where I am going. And Thomas, good old Thomas, says, Wait a minute, Lord. We don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? Now, it's, it's easy for us to look at this and think, Thomas, are, are you a dunderhead or are you just dumb? I mean, I mean what, are, are you just stupid? I mean, come on, Thomas. And if you read what Jesus says to him, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And then he says, if you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And then Philip chimes in. Yet I love Philip. Lord, show us, to, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Oh, just show us the Father. We'll be fine. Now, at this point, Jesus gives a little bit of a rebuke. How many have been rebuked at one time or another? I mean, by God or maybe a spouse. Anyway, I mean, we'll go there. Jesus said, don't you know me, Philip? Even though I've been among you for such a long time, 
Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Come on, Philip. Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Now, Bible historians believe that it was 50 or 60 years after the events of John chapter 14 that John begins to write his gospel. So 50 to 60 years. And I see in my mind's eye is, and, and, and is, it is believed that, that, that uh, John was in Ephesus when he writes the book, uh, the gospel. And so 50 or 60 years removed from that scene in the upper room with Jesus, John begins to write his gospel and empowered by the Holy Spirit, he remembers the words of Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. You see, Jesus was not created. He is eternal. He has always been in fellowship with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. There has never been a separation in that in the Trinity. God, uh, Jesus was always there. He was always part of the Trinity. And he tells his disciples, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. This is all that you need in this life. You've seen the Father. You've seen me. You've seen me. You've seen the Father. We, they are one. You cannot separate that at all. Paul was talking about Jesus when he gave us these words in Colossians chapter 1. He is the image, he, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, things on heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And then John writes in John uh, chapter 1 verse 3, through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. Jesus was at creation. He created all life forms. He is the perfect example uh, to the world of what creation was all about. But because of sin, that relationship was shattered. That relationship caused a divide. The sin of Adam and, Adam and Eve broke a right relationship with God. And now humanity is separated from a whole God and how are you going to get that back together again? If you read all through the Old Testament and the nation of Israel, everything that, God, that, that was happening through them coming out of bondage, uh, Egyptian bondage, all of that mixed together was God bridging the gap between man and humanity. I'm thankful that you did not bring your goats and sheep this morning for me to kill an altar, an offer on an altar of sacrifice. I'm glad we did not do that. I've even gotten to the point, I don't clean fish anymore. I just throw them back in. But all of that was starting to set up. God trying to reach out to humanity. If you read the, the, about the nation of Israel, it, it, it went sideways. They begin to think, oh, we're, we're somebody. And, Finally, Jesus came. Sin disrupts life. If there's anything else in this world, sin disrupts life. Think, think of your own situation. Has sin disrupted your life before? Sin is defined as grasping of things or pleasures for ourselves, regardless of the welfare of others and the commands of God, which leads to cruelty to others and rebellion against God. Mankind was created without sin, morally upright and inclined to do good. But sin entered into human experience when Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve violated the direct commands of God about eating certain fruit from a certain tree. Because Adam was the head and the representative of the whole human race, his sin affected all generations. 
Paul would write to the Romans, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, Adam, death through sin, and in this way death came to all men, because all sinned. Associated with this guilt, this sin is a corrupted, tarnished, sinful nature that we have to deal with. We have to deal with this. You know, I always thought growing up, okay, I'll get saved and everything will be fine. Disneyland. Worlds of fun. Wonderful. But as an older guy in my church, in our church in Fort Scott, said, Pastor, I, d I didn't know what problems were until I came to know Jesus. And he took away my sins, and then I realized, wow, I've got this battle going on day in and day out with a sinful nature that wants me to go back into sin. And I battle with that every day of our lives. I hate to be the one to break the news to you. You're going to battle with that until you die. Oh, well, great, Pastor. That's just what I came to hear today. You're going to constantly battle the human nature until we all take our last breath or Jesus raptures us out of here. There was be this constant back and forth. Sin disrupts life. Out of this perverted nature that sins, that, of the sin that people commit, no one is free from the involvement of sin. Again, Paul wrote to the Roman believers, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Sin caused a break in the relationship between God and humanity. Sin brought about separation, a chasm between God and His creation. Sin disrupts life. Listen to me. I don't care if you're a Republican or Democrat. You may be even out there as a Libertarian. Whatever. I don't care. I don't care if you're black or white, brown or yellow or red. It doesn't matter. The division you're seeing in the world today is not Republican against Democrat. It is not white against black. It's about a holy God and the evilness of this world. That's the bottom line. It's not about conservative versus liberal. No. It's about who is in control. And control is an issue of sin. Because control says, well, I'm better than you are. And so I'll run things. Well, you're stupid. <laughs> I mean, honestly. I'm, I'm telling you, this is my soapbox. Let me get on a soapbox just for a little bit here. Congress cannot organize a two-car parade and get it right. <laughs> And, and, and if they tried to organize the two-car parade, it would come out with 15,000 pages of what you can and can't do that would include everything from, from, uh, from uh, uh, national security to, to the Commerce Department to the EPA. You would so messed up in this world. Control has to do with the sin of this world. And all that's going on in our world today is because of sin. It's because of sin. One man knelt on the neck of another man and killed him. It was sin. I'm sorry. I don't care what side you're on. It's sin, dear friends. It's sin. That's what is going on in this world. It's not political. It's sin. Sin disrupts life. The sin of Adam and Eve didn't just stop there. It was expressed later when their son, Cain, killed his brother Abel. Once sin came into society, it expanded, it grew with an incredible rate. From the time of Adam and Eve, here we go, from the time of Adam and Eve until you get to Noah and God singing in the flood. From Adam and Eve to the time you get to Noah and the flood, it's about 15 to 1600 years, 1,500, 1,600 years. About that much time passed by from Adam and Eve to the flood of Noah. Here's what it says. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, and in every inclination, And that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all 
the time. And the Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth and his heart was filled with pain. And because of sin, God sent a powerful flood that would judge the world that covered the earth and destroyed humanity. Sin disrupts life and it still disrupts life today. All of the evil in the world today can be traced back that someone committed a sin against another human being or against God. The anger, the aggression, the hostility, the discord that we're seeing on the evening news relates to sin. Everyone must admit slavery is a disgusting evil that has characterized our nation for too many years. Slavery is still going on today. According to a recent report, 25 million people are enslaved today. 25 million people worldwide are enslaved today. Now we call it human trafficking. We kind of cleaned up the words. But it's still slavery. It still exists in the world today. Paul would write against the sinful nature and he said, so I say live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the sins of the sinful nature. Uh, for, for the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. Saints, as long as you have breath, you're going to be at odds with your sinful nature. It's a constant battle that will rage in your life till the day you die. Sin disrupts life. Guy tells a story. He was <laughs> visiting some friends of his and in the bedroom where he was staying he had, they had had a little cage with a hamster in it. Hamster's name was Hammy, of course. And in this cage this hamster had everything it needed. It had some, some uh, cedar um, shavings for a bed and had plenty of water and food and you know everything you'd need. It had a little wheel inside there. Now apparently Hammy had some issues. Instead of getting in the wheel and running and getting some exercise, he had found out a way to get on top of the wheel and kind of balance there for a while until eventually the, the weight of it would begin to move and it would drop him on his head. Boom! And he kind of shake himself a little bit and he would crawl back up and manage the best he can and get on top of that thing and, and just kind of lay there until finally the wheel started to turn and boom! Same thing again. And he began to wonder why? Why would a hamster who has everything everything he needs, disregard the wheel's proper use and do something that only hurts himself. And then why, why would he do it again and again and again? But the bigger question is this, why do we, supposedly smarter than hamsters, do the same thing again and again and again and again and again? It's because we wrestle against the sinful nature that is at battle with God. Sin disrupts life. Here's another thing that it does. Not only does sin disrupt life, but it separates us from God. Here's this chasm, this divide. People are lost from God. They're separated from God. And here's where society needs a bridge. One of the oldest questions of mankind is, has been asking, how can I know God? How can I get to God? How, what is He like? How can I please Him? How can I get to heaven? If we, if we work hard enough and, 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 and be a good person and, and, and help other people, then surely that will get His attention and He'll get me into heaven. No. The only answer to get to God is what's called the Gospel. And the Bible talks about, it refers to it as the good news, by the way. And the good news is that we can have a relationship with God. We can bridge this chasm, this gulf that is between us and God. Sin separates us from God and everything changed uh, for, for all of sin and falls short of the glory of God. The writer of Isaiah says, we're told your iniquities have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so he will not hear you. 
It's especially bad news because there's no way to get across that gap on our own. We've tried to find our way back to God, and we can't get there. Again, we've tried religion. Well, if I just give enough money, if I just become a moral person, and maybe if I take philosophy, I can figure out what's going, what's heck, and what's next. Maybe if it's just more education. Any number of ways people try and find their way to God, and none of them works. The only way to get to God, the only way to find peace with God, is what the Bible tells us, which is the gospel, which we come to Him and say, God, I'm a sinner. I need you. I ask your forgiveness. Paul says, but God demonstrates His own love for us, that while we were still sinners, Jesus died for us. That's the good news. Dear friends, Jesus has already done the work for us. All we have to do is come to Him and admit, I am a sinner. I need your help. I need forgiveness. Oh God, come into my heart and life. The work has already been done. There is nothing you can do in this life except accept Him by faith, dear friends. You cannot work your way into heaven. You cannot buy your way into heaven. You cannot, well, if I attend the church on Wednesday nights, I'll be there. No, 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 no. Wednesday nights will not save you, dear friends. It will not get you anywhere but time away from your home. It will come into the presence of God when we say, God, I'm a sinner. I need your saving grace forgive me of my sins there is nothing you can do except ask God's forgiveness nothing nothing the good news is what Jesus told Nicodemus for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life what then should our reaction be to this news it's what John would also go on to say, I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. Jesus became the bridge that would provide access of a sinful society to a holy God. And when we celebrate Christmas, we're celebrating the coming of God into this world. Jesus was born for the sins of the world. Then he would weigh out on Calvary, which we celebrate at Easter when we celebrate his death and resurrection for the sins of the world. Jesus and the cross became the bridge that would allow a sinful world to reconnect with a holy God. Jesus was the perfect bridge. Church, I don't know why you're here today. Maybe it's because you didn't have anything else to do. And you thought, well, I'll, I'll go to church today. Maybe you're here because it's a habit. Sunday morning, boom, I'm in church. It's, it, it. Some of you may be here today because you're lost and looking for guidance. Someone may be here today because you're separated from God and you need a bridge. Someone may be here today because you're struggling with your sinful nature. Whatever your reason, let me tell you, Jesus is the perfect bridge for you to take a step of faith and come to God. When we look at the sinful nature, Paul wrote about, and he said some interesting things. I read part of this a while ago the opening part of Galatians chapter 5. But if you get in on verses 19, 20, and 21, Paul says, and he talks about the sinful nature, and he talks about sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery. He talks about idolatry. Now, in our day and time, we say idolatry. We don't, we don't worship idols. If you worship your job, it may be your idol. If you worship your home, it may be an idol. If you worship your bank account or your car, it may be an idol. He says witchcraft. By the way, some people believe that witchcraft is a form of control. He talks about hatred. That's what's going on in the world today. He talks about discord. That's what's going on in the world. One of the sinful natures is that of jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. 
it's, it's easy for us to look at the news and say, boy, oh, those are a bunch of mean dudes out there. They are evil. But the acts of the sinful nature can be these. Jealousies. Fits of rage. Selfish ambitions. Hatred. Impurity. And it's easy for us to bypass those and say, well, I'm, I'm not doing what they're doing. But we all battle with a sinful nature day in and day out. And it's because of the sin that is within this world. Friend, do you need a bridge today? Let me tell you, Jesus is here. He is here right where you are. And, and if you're watching on YouTube or you're watching on Facebook or, or Band, if you're watching any of those, please understand, the bridge Jesus is here for you today, whatever that is, whatever that looks like. And so the, the next step is come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Eternal God, we bow to you. Eternal God, we seek you. Jesus, we know that you came to be the perfect bridge, to bridge the gap, the divide, the chasm between sinful humanity and a holy God. I thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross and rising from the dead three days later. I thank you for that. I thank you that you became the perfect bridge so that I can have a relationship with you and God the Father. Holy God, speak to us. Holy God, we come to you. We need you today. Not religion, not church. We need you. Oh God, we need you this morning. In the perfect name of Jesus. Amen. If there is a gap, a division between you and God this morning, I encourage you to call upon Jesus right now. Maybe you want to come to an altar. Maybe you want to kneel right where you are. Maybe you want to pray for someone that you know is not in a relationship with God, a current relationship with God, and they need Jesus. Church, I want you to find a place of prayer. It may be for you or someone else, but I want you to find a place of prayer and call upon God. Call out to Jesus. Come to Jesus.